That's 100 kilometers an hour. That was 51 meters in four seconds, and I have my foot hard into the pedal. It just would not pull up. This is the new GWM Tank 500. It's getting some great reviews straight out of the gate. In fact, some are calling it a Prado killer. I'm not sure about that. I don't know if some of those publications are being paid by GWM to say things like that, because on first impressions, it does have some great features and specifications, but dig a little deeper and you'll see that there are some shortcomings. Let's have a closer look. This is the top of the range hybrid version, lots of chrome. I reckon it actually looks a little bit dated already just by the chrome, like that's a bit of a 90s thing, isn't it? It's also got a bit of a, uh, a Ram or even Dodge kind of design theme with the headlights. Around at the back, we've got the spare wheel on the tailgate, which is awesome. That means you don't have to get under the, the vehicle on muddy surfaces and retrieve the spare or dig out the uh, everything from inside the boot. It does have a side swinging tailgate as well. It doesn't have all that much boot space with the third row up actually. Um, it does have the security blind in the way there, but you can see the leg room down below. I will jump in the back and we'll have a good look at that. But yeah, that's not too much boot space actually uh, for this segment, even with the third row up. You do have a big shelf or trough in the back there so you can hide away some things. From the back, I think it does look like a Prado quite a bit, apart from these tail lights, very tall. But even this little section here, the number plate holder, that's pretty much identical to the Prado, except it's just mounted slightly higher. With the hybrid pack, you get a two liter turbo petrol four cylinder paired with an electric motor assist system. The electric motor actually produces 78 kilowatts, which is a fair bit uh, for a hybrid. So it's almost like a plug-in hybrid in terms of the power output but you can't actually plug this in. And then combined, you've got 255 kilowatts, which is very impressive for this class. The official zero to 100 time though is 8.3 seconds, which is not actually that quick for that much power, but we'll do some performance testing later on anyway. It's an awesome interior in here, and I'll show you that in a minute, but I just wanna go over some of the initial specs. Firstly, the price. The top spec model is 73,990. You can get a Prado or the outgoing Prado VX for 76,000, excluding on-road costs. Add, you know, three or four grand for on-road costs. You're about 80 grand for the Prado VX. It's only about a six grand difference. And with the Toyota, you're obviously getting that reliability history and proven uh, engineering. Whereas this is not proven yet. It's a brand new model. We don't have long-term data, ownership experience, and things like that to go off. So I think with the Prado, six grand difference, it's not really that much to pay for that extra peace of mind or potential extra peace of mind. Another element that suggests to me that this is not as good as a Prado is the weight. So the curb weight of this is 2.6 tons, which is crazy. I know this is the hybrid model, so electrical gear does weigh quite a bit, but the Prado weighs about 2.3 to 2.4 tons, a 200 kilograms difference. And weight is an enemy of everything. So acceleration, braking, handling, efficiency and also off-road performance. You don't want a heavy vehicle because that means it's gonna bog right down in the mud or sand or wherever you are. And that brings me on to the fuel economy. So the official fuel consumption average of the hybrid is 8.5 liters per 100 kilometers. That's not impressive at all for a hybrid. Usually the, 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 the test cycle favors hybrid models just because of the way it's structured, that hybrids actually come up really good, especially plug-in hybrids. 8.5 for the official test means you're gonna be getting about 9.5 to 10. And in fact, the trip computer here says 11, and I've just driven on the highway for about an hour. Uh, and that's just far too high. And in fact, if we look at the Prado diesel, I know it is a diesel, not a petrol like this, it's rated at 7.9 liters per 100 kilometers, and that's not a, not a hybrid. So this is the outgoing model I'm talking about, 7.9. So it's less than this, and this is a hybrid. That does not make sense, in my opinion. We'll go for a drive in a minute and we'll see how it goes. I've already driven it on the highway, so we'll jump to that footage first. I've literally just picked it up and then put the camera on my head and then yeah, jumped on the highway to come out here. And then we'll do some uh, off-road testing and then do the performance testing as well. I'm interested to see how this goes. 255 kilowatts should go really well. Um, I'm also interested to see how the braking goes because as we know, the little brother of this car, the Tank 300, pops its rear wheels under heavy, heavy braking the non-hybrid version anyway. 
So we'll see how this goes. Getting back to this interior though, it is a really nice package. So very soft leather seats. You've got soft touch materials all across the dash. This kind of fake wood, even though it is fake and it does feel kind of cheap and plasticky. At least it looks nice and refined. Extends all the way across the dash, the door trims. It's a really nice interior, even the roof lining. It has good cabin acoustics, which means it doesn't feel, you know, hollowy and echoey in here. It actually feels like a premium product. We've got some interesting details down here. There's not much chrome, which I like. There's a little bit of trimming around there, but not, not over the top. It's just these metallic buttons and then the, uh, the chrome uh, adjustment for the climate control. And we've got a crystal-like start button there, a bit like some of the BMW models. And then a obviously Bentley-inspired clock in the middle. Wireless phone charger. Then some buttons and modes for the off-road settings. I'm not a huge fan of this climate control panel because if I want to turn the heat up, for example, you've got to actually go into push the screen and then you can do that. Or you can hit one of the, uh, the buttons down here so you can turn it on and off and that'll pop up as well. But I'd prefer just to have heat uh, temperature, the up and down, down here. So I can just drive along, don't even have to look down there and know that that's where the button is and it's adjust it while I'm looking forward. I don't want to have to touch the screen to do that. But I do like the way you've got a separate uh, air conditioning button so you can turn that on and off and then your fan speed as well. And your, your recirculation for that matter too. So if you're going in tunnels and so on, you don't have to dive into the screen, you can just hit uh, recirculation just there. Fully digital screens as well. Nice big screen up above. It's pretty easy to use. Um, you've got all your apps there and then your instrument cluster down here. It's also relatively easy. You can toggle between uh, the different display modes uh, with this little arrow there. I'll just go around this side, there's a bit less sun. In the back, I've got heaps of room. Like, look at all that leg room. That seat is actually tilted forward a little bit, but even so, there's plenty of leg room here. You've also got some climate control settings with your climate vents up in the ceiling, including for the third row. And the soft seats in the back as well with that diamond-like stitching pattern. Yeah, definitely very comfortable. This is slightly reclined as well. I'm not sure if you can adjust the recline. Yep, so you've got adjustable reclines. You can lay it right back actually and just sit back and relax. Accessing the third row, it doesn't actually flip all the way up by the looks of it. And I'll try and get in the back there. I'll just remove that security blind. Well, I'm back here. Uh, it does feel quite cramped. You can slide the middle row forward, so that is good. But even so, my feet are pretty high up. Like the floor is pretty high, which pushes my knees up. And that just makes it feel a little bit uncomfortable. But also the headroom is not that great. I'm only 170 centimeters and it's almost touching my head there. So if you're a bit taller, yeah, this would become quite a cramped little spot compared with some of the rivals in this class, like the Everest, Prado and so on. They, they do have more room, in my opinion anyway. You do have a cup holder there, so that's good. I'd expect USB ports too, actually. These sort of new, new brand vehicles they're great with technology. They're, they're really on top of that. Whereas this, for some reason, is just missing it. All right, let's hit the road now. As I said, we'll jump to the highway portion first, and then we'll do some uh, handling tests, and then go out onto the dirt, and then we'll do the performance testing last. One thing that is very impressive is the technology. So when I parked it before, yeah, crazy cameras, awesome detail. The only thing I don't really like is the, so i just turn that off. Stop making a noise. Uh, is the detail with the vehicle. So when you're moving around, lots of beeps and so on with these new cars. When you're reversing, you can't quite see that your car. Like you can see the wheel markings there only just. It'd be nice if they were like a, a bold black, just so you knew exactly where the wheels were. Because it takes you to, you know, a bit of time just to focus exactly where the car is. I've got great visibility, as is the case with most large SUVs in this segment, sort of off-roaders, Pajero Sport, Prado, Isuzu MUX, and so on. Uh, I can see around me very easily. It feels like I'm sitting pretty high up too. So I've got a commanding view over everyone, everyone around me. It doesn't feel too big or bulky, really. Uh, you get a sense of the width. It, it feels, you know, a bit wider than a standard, standard vehicle, obviously, but it doesn't feel intimidating. 
So down this tricky little ramp is where the cameras will come in handy. So I can see I'm not going to hit the wheel on that side, but on this inside bit, I'm getting a bit close so I can just steer around that way. Really, you shouldn't be, you know, looking at the screens, in my opinion, when you're driving, but it does come in handy just as a bit of a, a safety net if you're completely unsure. The steering feels nice and light and predictable, like I can feel what the front wheels are doing. It does feel a bit soft. I've only literally driven it about 800 meters but it just feels a little bit soft like this the braking and so on like it really moves around a bit when you're steering and braking so it'll be interesting to see if those rear wheels come off the ground during emergency stopping like in this car's little brother the tank 300. we're going to go on the highway now where we can see how the uh oh it's got those annoying indicators so you just need to touch the indicator once and i mean just touch it gently to trigger the sort of three three tap uh, as a three um, three flash sequence but if you click it all the way it'll stay on the whole time but it's yeah it's just try it's very difficult to balance how much you need to push it just to trigger that three three pulse sequence this vehicle does come with a driver monitoring camera here Please take a break. <laughs> obviously going off thinking that I'm not concentrating even though I'm looking dead straight ahead the camera is on top of my top of my head so it's not like it's interfering with my you know the vision from to my eyes or anything like that but obviously when I'm moving my hands around maybe it's picking up that I don't know I'm not paying attention or something I find these driver monitoring cameras really frustrating in all vehicles, not just this, but some of them are calibrated a bit better than others. I think uh, this system is already, you know, sending warnings and things. Even when I picked the vehicle up, uh, just to drive out to that car park where I just was, it was already sending warnings without the camera on my head as well. So just to give you a bit of an idea, and I wasn't talking and moving my hands around. So just to give you a bit of an idea of its sensitivity. It is very quiet and, and seems refined on the highway. Comfortable as well, hitting the little reflectors and the lane markings. Doesn't crash like some vehicles do. I'll just do that again for you. Try and hit a couple. Yeah, it, it definitely is comfortable. It's It's got a soft setting by the feel of it. But we'll do some uh, cornering tests as well later on just to make sure. This does come with uh, lane keep assist and, and constant lane keep management. So the steering is constantly making adjustments. While driving. Which I find pretty frustrating and I think some people would. Like my mum, if she got into this car and started driving and the steering wheels, you know, turning itself, she should start, start to freak out and think, what the hell's going on here? Um, so I think systems like that shouldn't be on by default. I haven't turned anything off, I haven't touched anything, by the way. This is just standard, got in the car, turned it on and started driving. I get that some safety systems have to be turned back on as a part of ANCAP's rules, but I think constant steering adjustment should not be on by default. You should have to push a button to activate that. I've been driving now for about 15 minutes and the driver monitoring camera has gone off about 16 times. Uh, and I've just been, you know, driving as normal, cruising along the highway, both hands on the wheel. It definitely needs some tuning. Just before we get into the ride and handling, I just want to show you something. So I'm going 80 kilometers an hour. Flick the steering wheel a little bit like this, and it just feels really, really squirmy. I, and don't take my word for it. Go take one for a test drive. Do the same thing. Just be a little bit sort of wiggly with the steering wheel, preferably on a nice open road where there's no cars around, and just see how it feels. And do it in your own car as well, and you'll see the difference. Because to me, this feels like the chassis is made out of gummy bears. It just really squirms around, and it probably gives us some indication of just how soft the suspension is. Yes, 
but we'll go and tackle some cornering uh, nice bends in a, in a second and see how it hand we'll go and tackle some nice corners in a second and see how it handles we're averaging 11.2 liters per 100 kilometers now and i've been driving pretty much 100 percent on open roads just cruising along uh, no sort of stop start driving or anything like that that's not a good indication of the uh, long-term economy, at least in these conditions. A lot of the time hybrids do perform better in the city and when you're driving slowly because the battery can regenerate, uh, recharge, sorry, and give you that electric, more electric power. But when I'm cruising along like this, the electric power isn't really providing much help. Except for when you put your foot down, you can feel that there is that instant torque low down to help with overtaking but it doesn't actually feel like it's got 255 or it produces 255 kilowatts either i'll just slow down a bit and show you so we're going 60 kilometers an hour i'll floor it like it goes okay but it it doesn't push me back in my seat that much not what 255 kilowatts would suggest anyway it just feels like it's you know a 180 kilowatt two liter petrol turbo or something it doesn't feel that impressive but we'll do the full performance test with the v-box to verify that through some bends yeah there's definitely a bit of body roll happening the steering is a little bit numb kind of what you'd expect for a vehicle like this anyway but yeah the bumps are not really managed very well i think that's the biggest letdown you just lose a little bit of control over the uh, over bumps on corners even along a straight section like this bit of a rippled section a rippled tarmac it's just shaking around quite a lot I think the suspension is too too soft there's too much wheel movement in other words it should be a bit more controlled but yeah higher speed bends seem to be okay it's the slower stuff where the body roll really comes yeah it comes alive kind of thing and you can really feel it in a bad way whereas when you're just you know leaning around big bends like this it's not so bad and it's hanging on okay too it's not you know there's no premature tire squeal or anything like that it's actually holding on overall though the driving impression on the road look it's not as dynamic as most of the rivals including the Toyota Prado it's just the suspension is not tied down enough the steering is very numb and the powertrain is a little bit inconsistent as you'll see in the upcoming zero to 100 tests i don't think it feels like it has 255 kilowatts it does go okay but yeah not 255 kilowatts and the fuel consumption overall today i've been driving for four hours is averaged 14.2 which is not very good for a hybrid whatever way you look at it it does have an impressive electric motor though as i said so 78 kilowatts that's a powerful electric motor for something that's not a plug-in hybrid so you've got to hand it to GWM for fitting such a powerful motor but it just doesn't seem to be meshed well with the petrol engine because you don't feel like you're getting that full potential out of it everything else though look the visibility is great I can see out very easily the pillars at the back aren't too thick so I've got a pretty good idea of what's going on around me and as I said the build quality inside feels good like all the materials and everything they feel good uh, including for this price range it feels quite yeah just nice and tightly put together it is shaking around a little bit because of that suspension but i think the trim is actually uh is is done well it's just the the suspension is what lets it down how does it go off-road i'll save the more serious off-road test for the petrol model in a separate video we'll do the separate performance timing as well but we'll just go along this dirt road pretty rough dirt road and see how it handles there is a, uh, well, there's that camera coming up again, giving me some guidance around a slightly technical little narrow bit. But there is a uh, off-road pages mode here too. That gives you a bit of an idea of, a bit of a snapshot of what, uh, what settings you've got and how the vehicle is, you know, the approach angle and all that sort of thing, or the angle, sorry, that it's, that it's on, tire pressures, and then your center diff lock there too, by the looks of it, and rear diff lock. This road's got a fair few potholes along here so we can see how that soft suspension handles it is very comf comfortable at the moment uh, but it is shaking around a little bit 
yeah, definitely very comfortable, um, but I'm just losing just a tiny bit of steering because it's bouncing over the top of the bumps rather than pushing the wheel right down into the bump. Another little narrow section here, and the camera's automatically engaged. Yeah, I think that, that camera system is, is definitely very handy and quite good quality too. If we just veer off the side here, it puts the, uh, the vehicle in a kind of uncomfortable position. That rear wheel is almost off the ground, but it's got a lot of flex actually, because I've been through there in utes and things, and usually the, the rear wheel comes off the ground just because of the diagonal um, stress there, but that felt like the wheel didn't even leave the ground so definitely good suspension travel yeah I'll definitely give it that it's very comfortable uh, when you're just cruising around like this bit of a pothole through here yeah that's nice I don't have it engaged in four-wheel drive or anything like that as I said, we'll save the more serious off-road stuff uh, for the petrol model in a separate video. Just to give you a bit of an idea of the flex going on, I mean, it probably doesn't look that serious on camera, but as I said, utes and things usually just pop the rear wheel in the air as it goes around that bend because there's a big ditch through here, but that's just soaking it up easily. I'm keen to see how it goes in more serious off-road settings. There's also a Conqueror perspective mode that gives you those full cameras you can see where you are positioned on the road and you can rotate it around and see exactly where you are but you can only use this below 10 kilometers an hour if i speed up a little bit it says yeah not available on the road the suspension isn't very good but off the road it's actually quite nice at low speeds anyway like i wouldn't want to hit a pothole a surprising pothole you know, it would really jolt the cabin and, and probably unsettle the, uh, the stability as well, just because it is so soft. But yeah, off the road, it seems to soak up the bumps well and provide a lot of flex. All right, let's head out now to do the performance test and see what it goes like. Yeah, braking performance is terrible. That was 51 meters in four seconds, and I had my foot hard into the pedal. It just would not pull up. I'm gonna try that again. I'll let the brakes cool down a bit, but I'll try that again. 100 kilometers an hour, hard on the brakes. Again, that looks like it's four seconds. Yeah, 50 meters. 
0.05 meters from 100. So it seems to be having a bit of problem with uh, launch control. It takes off okay, but then the power is kind of cut about halfway down the quarter mile. So I can't get a good quarter mile result, but I'll try again. So the stability control or traction control keeps turning back on and as you can probably see there the power is really reduced after about 100 kilometers an hour I've got my foot mashed into the floor and it's just ticking over the kilometers an hour as you can see here it was going 140 and 141 so yeah there's something going on there even though the battery is half full as well that run was 8.8 .8. 8.79 the previous run was 7.71 definitely some inconsistencies there so i've tested a toyota camry hybrid same conditions same v-box repeated runs you know five runs and it's pretty much the same result you know within a few fractions of a second same result each time it doesn't really matter it figures itself out whereas this it seems like it doesn't like the battery beyond 50 percent or something and it starts to cut the power.